So I'm going to go through some of the first parts of this a little quickly, but um, where does uh, all of this begin? Um, Drizzle began back in, uh, in uh, 2005 at the MySQL CAB. The CAB is My MySQL's customer advisory board. And what we do is we take about 16 companies into the room um, and we try to take and solicit information from them. In fact, this, uh, Mark Callahan's in the room. I can even tell you about one because he's been to one. So what we do is we bring customers in. We say, what are you interested? What are you excited about? And we usually tell them what we've been working on. And for 2005, what we did is we went in and talked about what we were working on for MySQL uh, version 5. And so we talked about store procedures and views and triggers and got all of them, you know, all of them sitting in the room listening. And I noticed at the end of the room that, well, I noticed that they really weren't all that interested. And so what I did was I said, um, okay, so who in the room is interested in what we have on the roadmap in, uh, you know, five, five zero? And about half the room raised their hands. And that half of the room was the OEM vendors. These are guys who needed MySQL as a drop-in replacement for Oracle. So basically they needed something cheaper than what they were paying for for Oracle um, at the moment. So we were cheaper, they were happy to use us. And they wanted features so that they could actually work like they do work with Oracle. You know, make it as little, you know, little difference as required, basically make it friendly for them. So it was kind of like a cheap knockoff for them and that's what they were interested in. On the other hand, we turned and asked, and asked like, so what about Yahoo's and the Googles and so forth? And we got a, like a really interesting set of feedback, like, hey, by the way, we're never going to enable any of these features. We're going to be disabling stored procedures. We're going to be disabling big uh, triggers. Until you fix subqueries, we are going to disable subqueries. We don't want any of these features. What we want you to talk about to us is how are you going to improve performance? What are you going to do to make replication simpler for us? And they would go down the list of things they were interested in. And they were kind of heated about this. In fact, the meeting that occurred right after that, Linden Labs actually showed up and said, here's the deal, this is how much money we have to pay you, and we will not pay you a cent for anything that you're currently doing. So therefore, this is how much money you've got to get from us. These are our interests. And it was a sizable amount of money. And so from this, I started kind of, you know, the takeaway of like, well, what we had done with MySQL 5.0, has this really been a good idea? We're getting an awful lot of people who say they really don't care about any of these features and just really are kind of in some ways uh, unhappy that they even exist in their environments. You know, people are like commenting these features out. And so from this, I started writing down notes like, you know, what, is, what would we have done if we hadn't started working on these features? What, you know, what was I thinking I needed for running websites? What was the pieces that I hadn't seen being developed that really needed to be developed? So what the next part of this is actually kind of gets into a little bit of the talk. We, in 2005 at OSCON, we had a uh, talk about uh, MySQL's uh, march to being ANSI SQL. And there was this jump, big giant room, and there were about 20 people in it, and everybody was reading their laptop, and no one gave a shit whatsoever about the topic. And when I raised my hand at the end, I said, so why do you guys come to this talk? You know, one guy raised his hand, and he said, oh, well, I work for Oracle. I'm kind of interested in this. And that was it. So there was a guy from Oracle in the audience who was interested about anti SQL. None of the rest of the guys were there. Very unattended talk. Um, so when we did this, we started actually thinking about. So I started sitting back and writing out some things. Like, you know, when I joined MySQL, one of the big things I wrote out was pluggable interface for storage engine. That was something. Because that's something that it really messed me up at Slashdot. We had our own stuff of storage engine there, and that storage engine itself was very, very hard to integrate. And eventually we threw it away because it was so hard to integrate and keep the integration going. Um, but really, that in itself, working on new architecture, I can do that in a lot of different open source projects today. I, I work on Gearman, I work on MimFetchD. There's a lot of areas where I can you know, spend my time you know, if I'm interested in working on different architectures. What really came back to me also in it was an interest in community development. And what I really wanted to do was completely change the notion of the way development was done. Um, I really wanted to go from an environment where patches were early on in MySQL's history would get accepted. As MySQL went on and on and on, it became harder and harder and harder to get a patch actually accepted. Um, I also <coughs> fundamentally reject the concept that any developer should ever sign over their rights to their source code to another entity. Um, I fundamentally believe that that's, an, that's something I can never ask a developer to do. That is something I feel uncomfortable telling someone. To me, you have to be able to track source code, you need to know where it came from, you need to be able to do reviews on it, but I do not need to own your copyright. Um, and so to me, changing that attitude was one of the big changes to get more people involved in community development. The other thing was to look at multi-core and concurrency issues. 
look at what features we have that frankly weren't actually performing very well based on these, toss them. Uh, anything we actually didn't think that would really focus where we wanted to go, which was focus on web applications and enable others. So the goal was, let's actually pick a particular domain problem and go after that. Let's not try to be an OEM database. Let's not try to go off and, you know, uh, tackle brick and mortar problems. Let's not go off and do these things. And it's interesting, we've settled down in web applications and web analytics. I mean, our two areas. Uh, we also want to do some, we also want to modernize the code base for manageability. When MySQL was written, people, you would say, hey, why didn't you use this piece in C++? Well, the answer was, is that MySQL was put together more than 11 years ago. C++ at the time was not very stable. Um, you know, things like the STL were not stable. You could not make use of the STL at that time. You could not actually use all features of C++ and hope to God that the compiler was actually going to make it work or make it even portable at that time. I mean, things like threading environments didn't, weren't even portable at that time. So one of the things that we did is we wanted to modernize the code base for manageability. So we go back and actually rewrite the thing in actual C++, uh, make it STL friendly, and we reuse lots of libraries that we find. So instead of the idea of everything we should write ourselves, let's go and actually find out what's actually available there. You know, when we go and we change, you know, uh, inside the database, we can change older style containers that were written inside MySQL over to STL containers. One thing we've noticed with incoming students that work on Drizzle, they immediately get it. It's the same thing they've been working on in their classes. The same thing they can do. <coughs> they can actually sit there and Google, you know, to their heart's content, container information and documentation on this and examples. They immediately get it, they immediately can come back and work on it. Make the code very easy to uh, people to go into. Um, philosophies, one of the things we first set out was what is actually the Suns team philosophy? You know, because we've got all these folks who are suddenly doing development on a database. You know, we need to be very transparent in what our actions are and what we do. Not just be, you know, hey, uh, we're the good guys. We're actually going to tell you these were our plans. So, you know, we set out and said, you know, we have an, op we have an well open and well documented interfaces. Have transparent goals and processes that are communicated publicly. Have fun and encourage others to collaborate. Remove barriers to contributions and participation for anyone. Which means we accept patches. We do a lot of patch accepting. We make sure that when we, you know, when you provide patches to us, we consider those to be something that we value. We push those up ahead of pretty much just about everything. Um, you know, and the other thing we do is actually to enable other contributors to build businesses around Drizzle. So, and this gets a little bit into like some of the architecture questions, but. And some basic thoughts, you know, rethink everything, not assume everything was bad. There are lots of good that we had in the database, um, but still we should rethink exactly how certain things are working. Other things, you know, silicon scales, uh, carbon does not. Uh, huh, slide isn't finished. Uh, basically, how can we actually make people more productive? How do we make more people more productive with the database um, without them, you know, you can't get more humans. So how do we make the database simpler and easier to use and easier to deploy and easier to sit in infrastructure? Uh, we don't play catch up. Um, we loop forward. Namely, we start looking at, like, we stop looking at problems that we just didn't feel uh, were anything we should be concerned about. You know, when we started this was over a year and a half ago uh, at this point. You know, sometimes people would say, well, are you sure you don't still want to care about 32-bit machines? I was positive. A year and a half later, we are extremely positive. We do not give a shit about 32-bit hardware whatsoever. We don't give a shit about actually putting in workarounds in to work around problems that 32-bit environments have. These are things we just don't do. They're code that people don't need to learn. We do not care about, you know, we have dumped platform after platform. We do not support HPUX. We do not support Amiga. We do not support any of these that, you know, still had in many places if defs throughout the code. And all that did was overly complicate what somebody had to do to learn something about the database. All these if depths of if this platform or this platform or that platform. We, we focus very much on what is going forward. Um, the other thing is that the world is 64-bit and there's a lot of RAM. In cases where we're looking at a performance question, we will burn RAM over we will burn over we will spend times in locks. That's fine. There's lots and lots of RAM. Let's make use of more RAM. Um, you know, the other thing we define is the web is UTF-8. Um, we accept data only coming in as binary data or as UTF-8 data. That's our validation system. We don't explore <coughs> any other character set at all inside the system. If you need to do a change to UTF-8, you can do that on the client side and send that into us. We are only UTF-8 internally. Um, we also went to a microkernel design where we could break out more pieces. So not just storage engine, but replication, logging, authentication, protocol, and parsing. 
This right here is the architecture slide we, so, we show nowadays. And this kind of represents um, a lot of things uh, that's going on right now. As far as different plugins that are being worked on. And a week ago, somebody made an extremely brilliant observation about this diagram that um, has really kind of brought home to me a lot of what we do. Because somebody, you would ask, in this environment, where is Drizzle? What are we? Drizzle um, are these lines. These communication lines you see that communicate between any given piece, that is Drizzle. Our goal is to be those lines. You know, we have, you know, we have a brand new executioner in build. You know, we have folks that are now working on a new optical. Each of these pieces will be components that are actually plugged into our environment. Um, we worry about how do we connect and make sure that we're the good glue for all of these different components. We're not concerned. The components themselves come from other individuals. If you're, you know, we have a, an example of, uh, <coughs> of the uh, Calpon engine uh, running right now. Their storage routing looks obviously different than, say, an ODB. <coughs> Paul's finished up PBXT recently, so we have PBXT going on. We have archive. We actually have uh, NODB, and I believe we even keep the extra DB one running every so often. But that's our goal, is to actually be these components that link all these other components together. You know, differences between, uh, you know, differences, we get in differences between uh, Drizzle and MySQL. You know, MySQL's architecture in this is much more monolithic. You can't pull pieces out from each pieces. Our parser today has very, left in it, very little left in it anymore that actually does validation. Our validation nowadays occurs at lower levels. So in our parser, our parser never says, hey, is this storage engine an actual valid storage engine? Our parser knows nothing at all about storage engines. Um, validation occurs later on in the actual system itself. These are something that are very <coughs> different. Um, the latest incoming patches for our, optimize, our optimizer, our optimizer is starting to look more like our actual SQL, uh, SQL executioner. In Drizzle, what happens is our parser come and you have an incoming part, you have in something that you come in incoming parse. What we do is we actually create what's called a statement object. And that statement object will then represent the rest of the, the contained state of an actual query. So that statement exists. The nice thing that means is that at the moment we know that a statement enters into our parser, we already now have specific memory for it. Before in MySQL, there was a, this giant lex structure that had everything in it from select to DDL, all these different members in it, all that case. All of that's gone in our environment. That's all pushed down into the actual uh, statement objects themselves. So that large chunk of memory that it carried around that had to keep growing every time a new feature was added to the parser is now done. Which also means now that when we start plugging in new parsers, um, new parsers, as they get plugged in, don't have to be concerned about this global lex concept anymore. Because what? They just have to generate actual statement objects um, in the tree. So we take statement objects, pass it down. Our optimizer objects are becoming the same. The join optimizer has many different types of join optimizers in it today. Um, Padraig's actually been taking that apart for us, where in the very near future, each form of the jo join optimizer is actually itself its own class. And we can actually do coercion to this class back and forth. There was a, um, I think I was talking to the Tokitech guy about this. It, within the new patch, it's very easy to actually knock out the nested loop join. This was something I was verifying last night. With the new work, we can actually knock out the nested loop join, and that work that we generally do for a nested loop join, a storage engine can come in and say, mm, I can take over that work, and then can actually just feed data back up the row, and not actually have to do all kinds of you know, crazy ass manipulation on different layers. Um, so it makes things a little bit simpler right now. So, you know, it's kind of been neat. We have people like looking at the parser now. And by the way, the folks who work on the Drizzle parser are people who never worked at Sun Microsystems. The folks who are working on those components never worked there. Um, today, um, we somewhere back in the uh, somewhere back in the uh, uh, winter, we did a look to see at our current contributors. At that point, Drizzle had more than 100 contributors. Understand, inside of Sun, there's only about six people paid that actually work on Drizzle. So from our existence now, the amount of contributions that Sun does. Um, you have a few people like myself who, can, who write an awful lot of code, but there are many weeks where we have where lots and lots of code changes nowadays come from people who are not related to Sun Microsystems at all. So, which has kind of been fun to actually watch. Um, the other things we've got, you know, as far as the routing protocol, this was all actually started in another company uh, that's been done. The uh, query memcache decache was actually done by some folks in Japan. So, all of this is uh, changing right now. Um, how big is it? This was done a little while ago. The Drizzle core kernel, uh, the, Drizzle cur uh, the Drizzle code itself is only about 315,000 lines. Of that, the kernel code 
part that actually sits inside uh, director uh, Drizzle D, um, for any of you in MySQL, it'd be kind of the equivalent of the SQL directory. The actual kernel itself is only about 120,000 120, lines of code nowadays. Because we've been able to extract pieces out to being out into information schema plugins. You know, the information schema list, the entire system now lives entirely based in plugins. As we pull this stuff out into plugins, the kernel has become smaller and smaller and smaller uh, in existence. So this is something that's a, a bit of a difference. Um, so where are we in some of this stuff? We work on a number of new things. And this gets into part of what is the differences between uh, Drizzle and uh, MySQL. Uh, one, we have a new protocol that's asynchronous. We can speak the MySQL protocol on the actual pro MySQL protocol port. This is something we added back this week. So you can take a MySQL application, fire it up, communicate with Drizzle on the uh, MySQL port. Um, or you can use the new protocol. And the new protocol is based in libdrizzle um, and go to town with it. It has asynchronous built in. It has built-in sharding. Uh, though we did add simple sharding even back to the MySQL one because it was pretty simple. Um, the whole protocol system itself is actually pluggable. So you can actually take the protocol out. Um, if you don't want to actually speak our protocol, if you want to speak some other database protocol, you can just shove that in. And if you want to actually pull the parser out, you can pull the parser out nowadays and place another parser in. All it has to do is create uh, create statements, uh, create I'm sorry, create create statement objects. Uh, and at that point, we can actually execute on them. So it's getting a move where all of these pieces are moving around and don't really require you to actually take any one particular uh, case. Um, the idea behind this, I sometimes call it, is runway. Um, you know, if we find, for instance, if the NoSQL movement starts to actually make it something that looks like we want to implement that protocol, we can place that <coughs> protocol in and then work with those protocol directly. I mean, that's part of the goal. Because when we look at things, it really internally in the end, in the internals, um, it's really all the same. Um, other things we did, um, the new protocol, libdrizzle, um, <coughs> The entire connectors to us are BSD. They can talk to they can talk to MySQL. They can talk to uh, Drizzle. The entire drivers are BSD. You no longer have to have a discussion with anybody anymore about what is the license of my product and the license of the database I'm connecting to. That whole discussion went away. It was one of the things that that Sun thankfully was very brilliant on and actually understood was the fact that that whole argument and discussion needed to be gone. And so we don't have to have license discussions anymore. Um, other thing is we have checksums in it, so if you want to checksum your actual stuff as it's going through, you can do that. So if you've got bad Ethernet cards, we can actually tell you about that. Um, something else also, our protocol, um, and even in the modification of the MySQL protocol, we don't accept uh, semicolon attacks anymore actually in the database. So the little Bobby Tables problem is gone. Um, we just don't allow that. If you send us a SQL query, we take a SQL query. That is it. We do not have in the protocol, um, within the Drizzle protocol, the ability to attack multiple uh, SQL statements in with a semicolon in the middle of them and be able to attack through that manner. We actually envelope all given SQL queries uh, up into our own system and then provide those actually to the parser. So a lot of these problems actually disappear as far as like weak attack methods. It's not like you still can't like you know get attack methods through other uh, forms of changes to your queries. But the weaker attack forms of, I just tacked on an, SQ, an extra SQL query, are all now gone. Um, this kind of gives you an example, a little bit of protocol class, having different things, be able to speak it. Um, storage engine, um, a large change that we made is that we looked and we asked our audiences, like, what engines are you using? And we found out that like 70% of the users out there generally are using NODB. And often the folks who are using MySAM are the ones that actually just don't know any better. They, they, you know, they type create table, and then they never knew that that was my ISAM table. And then when somebody comes back and they say, hey, my data was all corrupt, and they, the, the end user says, well, that was because it was my ISAM. Um, that kind of data corruption doesn't exist in NRDB's world. It has its own occasionally, but it doesn't exist quite like that. So we default in NRDB to the be the default storage engine. At the same time, we actually went through and actually optimized the database from end to end to start assuming that we actually had transactional engines. So there's not a lot of if-def and so forth code that all got removed because we know that by default, the default engine is actually NODB. Um, the other things that we've been able to do um, is actually start engines start handling on metadata. So inside of MySQL, there's a thing called FRM file. And the FRM file is a file that lives on disk. And what it does is it actually uh, controls the definition of the actual um, table itself. Now, the problem is, is that in many crash scenarios, you can actually end up in a case where 
NODB has made a correction, but the FRM file is out of, it's out of correct. For whatever reason, it's crashed. There is no uh, XA comparison, that XA of anything that's going on there that can actually happen. So you can have a case where DDL gets pulled or replication gets screwed up, and the next thing you know, your data dictionary file, your FRM file, is actually different than your, your NODB file. Drizzle a little differently in this. So what we do is internally, we actually have a language we use to represent um, how, uh, how table information should be communicated to the engine. It's called Google Proto Buffers. And so you can take a Google Proto Buffer, um, and an engine can generate a Google Proto Buffer and hand that back to the upper end. To do this, we create what's called a federated data dictionary, where every engine now owns their actual data information. Now, in NODB's case right now, we have an, an interesting little hack uh, that uh, is actually, uh, I'll be pushing the tree soon. The proto file is actually kept inside of NODB on the actual table where NODB keeps its own record information. So internally, NODB has a record information table. And we actually store our proto file directly inside that table in a blob. So when we go to do a read from NODB to ask, hey, is this your table? What NODB does is NODB says, yes, that is my table, and hands us back the proto. It also means that when NODB is doing an online alter operations or doing a rollback operations from a DDL operation change, because NODB can't actually roll back DDL operations, it actually rolls back to the previous definition state of the actual table, which means that what? It's all transactional. There is no chance where uh, NODB becomes inconsistent with disk any longer. Um, as far as things go. So that whole giant ass list of problems that exist generally with NODB, um, having problems with its FRM, all go away. Um, I actually shared uh, this information, by the way, with the uh, NODB team. Um, and there's actually a hack that maybe we'll put in MySQL to actually solve the problem as well. Because there's a, a table discovery thing that we added for archive and NDB that were done in 5.1. And they may be able to make use of that by storing their FRM and then during cases where they real about, uh, bad cases happen. They can just delete the file on disk, use table discovery, and repopulate the FRM file on disk. So they can actually get over the, the problems in MySQL. So occasionally we're able to share back some information that's actually important. Storage engine wise, though, we've actually left all the hooks. Um, our storage engine layer is not the MySQL storage engine layer anymore. If you're accustomed to one, you are not going to be accustomed to ours. Um, we have in our system today um, what we call a storage engine object. For you to create a storage engine, you have to create a storage engine object that actually handles all of your DDL operations, it handles all of your um, uh, uh, transaction uh, layer, all that stuff occurs. So it's not like we open a cursor anymore to create a table. All of that stuff actually occurs at the storage engine layer and is never operated on cursors anymore. In fact, we don't even have anything called a handle anymore. We just have things called cursors. And the cursors themselves are probably, yeah, you probably recognize 70% of what's still there. Um, from what we can see inside MySQL. Though with a lot of the callback stuff that we're getting from other engine vendors and stuff, the odds of it being looking like the same for very much longer are, are slim. So our cursor itself is actually changing. Um, logging, uh, we ripped out the general, the general log and the slow query log and now just have actual two points in the system. So in our world, you can actually just write a logger um, um, to go to town. Um, as soon as we did this, we had somebody pop in and write a Gearman logger so we could just take all given data out of uh, Drizzle, push that into uh, Gearman, and basically build a, an online query analyzer. Kind of like what you see in the one product, except that ours is an actual online system when it's running, doing query analysis against your entire cluster. Um, and it costs you nothing as far as time goes. So we have an online query analyzer, which is pretty sharp. Uh, amazing thing is when we did the, uh, the, the pre-post API and we posted it to the mailing list, um, somebody came back in about an hour and a half and had a syslog uh, a syslog uh, logger for us, which was kind of amazing. Like, it's just kind of like, ah, I figure I'll have to write that in a week or two. As soon as we put the API out, immediately somebody turned around and actually wrote one for us, um, which is kind of nifty. Uh, replication. Um, so we looked at the 5.0 replication, we looked at the 5.1 replication, we looked at what people are actually doing, and we made a couple decisions. One, we need engines not to lock. Um, NODB requires a bunch of heavy axle locks if you use statement-based replication. Two, most of the engines that we look at going forward really couldn't support statement-based replication, or they didn't want to actually hamstring themselves to support statement-based replication. On the same token, though, we looked at what was done in the 5.1 row-based replication, and we really weren't very happy with that either. 
Um, the information coming across the wire is proprietary. It's very hard to actually uh, read it. It's also not versioned at all. It changes in tiny little states with no real versioning going on. So what we want to do is create a real API. So we looked at uh, early on what Google had done when they had tried to build their own replication system. Um, we, and we found that a little bit interesting. Um, but from it, we also found the Google protobuffer code itself. And so what we've done is, is we actually have come up with a completely drizzle, non-required uh, data definition for actual replication. Um, and if you talk to some of the folks at Continuum and some other folks, a number of uh, uh, folks have actually been looking at this thinking, hmm, we might be able to implement this as well. Um, there's been a, at least one attempt to try to get Sloney to work with it, as uh, I'm told. But the nice thing about it is it's an entirely non-database specific replication uh, protocol. Basically, any database can actually generate protobuf messages and generate streams of these that then can be read by any other database. And then we can also translate them to any other database. Uh, we don't have uh, alter table down just yet. We do have create table down, though. So we can actually do a pure create table uh, in protobuf message that any other database can sit there and look at and go, oh, I know that, and can rearrange it real quick into their own create table statements. Alter table is kind of the, the last of the, the domains, and I think we've got the uh, proposal up for it uh, in the next week or two, uh, and we'll see what it's done. Um, LinkedIn has been like super helpful for us. Uh, they've actually been providing us all the QA. Um, to get all this shit done. So um, they've been going through the application, how does it work, you know, how do we make it more performant. Uh, Robert Hodges and Continuum have also looked at a number of things like how we can get group commit working faster and some other things. Um, uh, if you also know the, uh, I think as of, uh, since he was hired up, I believe Northscale it hires up the guy so Norscale actually now has the guy who actually wrote the Java replicator itself. So by the way, the protobuf message itself can all go to disk, it can all go out on the wire, it doesn't matter. Appliers um, can be written in any language. Um, it's, not like it, it's not like it was before where it was so tightly coupled. We may write a tightly coupled one, but at the moment we haven't. Um, I wrote a, as an example a, a Python script that went from uh, Drizzle to Postgres in about 30 minutes once we got this thing working. It was cake. Um, you know, one to MySQL, even simpler um, as far as things going. And so it was really not that difficult to make these things nowadays work. Um, in fact, in the, tungst the tungsten system, uh, the tungsten uh, replication product, which I, has open source components, there's actually an open source version of how to replicate from MySQL to Drizzle in that tool, cast, uh, in that tool system. Um, it's really easy having an open definition. It's not like you've got to take the MySQL bin log tool and sit there and pipe data through it and try to get SQL queries out of it anymore. Um, literally, if you can speak Java, Python, Perl, you can just open up one of these files, start reading through them, and executing on them. We have numbers of examples now. We've had people do it in Python, Java, uh, Perl. The stuff is really, really super easy to deal with. And the nice thing is you can actually take the protobuf streams and you can just build multi-master setups um, by just piping stuff back and forth however you want to. Or like what we practice with is using Gearman to actually handle centralized and then be able to break everything out into a star pattern. So the number of replication <coughs> patterns you can do uh, have went up. And this stuff's getting, uh, considering uh, about where we're at, this stuff's getting stable to the point of where uh, we're running into very few problems with it anymore. So hitting stability with this code uh, by January is uh, pretty good. And uh, actually uh, running on a running on a slave, the recent benchmarks with the replication system where we apply onto a read replication slave that's like sitting there doing full board with sysbench, no cost in performance. Read, still significant, but no cost on the actual read slaves as far as applying them there. So that's pretty good to see. Um, security 3As, I, I we went and walked around. In, in MySQL, you have one authentication pattern. You have to take grant or revoke and you have some tables. And the problem is most of you all have probably what? You have other identity systems in your environment. You probably have LDAP systems. You're probably going into PAM. You have whatever. So in Drizzle's world, we threw out the we threw out the authentication system. We have no built-in internal authentication system, which also means, by the way, that if you're in a shop where your password, your username is root and your password is null, I see many sheepish fins uh, faces across this. We don't have any cost to that. Uh, MySQL, even when you type skip grants, still has locks it has to go through during that system. We have no locks whatsoever that we touched during that period. So for us to turn on no rep uh, authentication, it's extremely dirt cheap at that point. Um, the thing also that's kind of nice about this um, is that you can plug in anything. 
For instance, um, I went and did the initial one to plug in PAM and LDAP, and it was really kind of simple. It's done it within about a half a day. So now you can have Drizzle at running. It can actually just go on and authenticate against PAM if you need to. Yeah, PAM's pretty awesome. Um, but then one of the cloud vendors who have been uh, working with Drizzle behind the scene uh, went back and actually did HTTP off. Because they were actually needing the fact that once somebody connected to the database, their authentication system was actually an HTTP auth system. So to get the user to their to get to the correct schema and stuff, the user connected to the database via their normal, you know, JDBC, whatever else type connection. And then that system would then go and make a call out to the HTTP auth system of their authentication system and then tell back, hey, by the way, these are the points. Yes. Yes. Uh, are there any uh, grain controls that would be possible? in terms of only allowing uh, reads for this particular, or something like that, or has all that code that says, hmm, what, uh, does the yeah, user so have act permissions uh, on this table? Has that all gone? So what we did is we pulled that out, and we put in the three hook points for authentication. So what we have is we have authentication, which just means where are you capable of authenticating to the system. The second part of that is uh, authorization. If you have authorization, to do selects, drops, any of these things. And the final piece we have here is an access control list. So as long as you plug whatever you need to into those three points, you're all good to go. So, that, But we talk about it in the, the essential three A's that, you know, we open up textbooks and we talk about, you know, how security is supposed to be done. We have broken it up into the proper, proper three A system so that you can drop in any security model you want to. So for instance, if you want to drop in a model that actually checks access control, um, on a given table, column, row, you name it, you can do that. That's all built in there to do it. So, um, let's see here. Other things, uh, extending uh, SQL via functions. We have a pluggable interface designed for this. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm hoping to really have, we have built in uh, support today for uh, Gearman and for Memcached. So we have functions of those built into the database. Um, I was playing around with this on the train. Uh, very soon, uh, you'll be able to do, I think I blogged about this months ago, you're going to be able to do group by operator, and that operator that you're calling can actually just be in, you don't have to name it Gearman whatever. It can be just a, a, a operator that they can go back to Gearman or whoever registered that they control that function. That's where the parrot stuff would be. So the, the thing is, is that at that point, you have true MapReduce operators um, actually in the database. And it's kind of interesting. It looks pretty close to what the Green Plum has as far as like <coughs> Green Plum's calls today their MapReduce system. We have that stuff pretty much built in. And the thing though is because of the way Gearman's design also that we can also link Gearman in, there's only a hop, skip, and a jump before we can actually even add the ability of where Aster Data does today and how Aster Data system works as well. So we can work both as a one or other or a hybrid between our two systems at this point. Um, and because of the way the fact that Gearman doesn't really get to care about like, what your data is, we don't have any problems with type data or anything like that. Um, data dictionary. Um, our data dictionary has no materialization costs. Our data dictionary uh, is not a standalone thing. It actually resides on top of the actual storage engine itself. Um, so when we go and you make a, a select off an information security, the information security the information schema actually is coming from the storage engine today. So it's not like it's a, a specialized thing anymore. Um, and for some of those we can call cursors back. We're actually starting to add into the uh, system uh, a, callback, uh, a callback method into where um, R&D Next used to live. So you can actually have a callback function do that. So things that need to provide data or spit data back out, like network databases or anything like, like these schemas, can actually spit rows data back out. And so you remove the whole give me a row, give me a row, give me a row uh, concept. Instead, you can say push row, push row, push row, which works really well for some designs. Um, so that whole point where we can go back to a, a, a callback mechanism inside our cursors, um, which has kind of turned out to be kind of useful in a couple of cases, because there's some things that really aren't designed to be cursors at all. Um, anyway, it extends the uh, current uh, IS plugin. We have a bunch of work that, we're start, that we leveraged up from uh, Robin Schumacher before he left, as far as new performance schema stuff goes. Um, we're still trying to decide exactly what we want. We have good interfaces, but we don't necessarily have good data that we're happy with. There was work that Stuart Smith did um, from that makes use of the latest Linux kernels, um, and that's pretty nice. Um, I also have uh, Sergey Petrunia, who works for Monty, uh, worked on a patch to allow uh, SQL tracing inside the optimizer. Um, so you can actually see the optimizer path as it goes forward and goes through it. Um, I've actually done a fair amount of work right now to uh, get that actually into Drizzle. 
and once we actually have in the, the new object oriented stuff around the joint control, um, I'll actually have that fully ended drizzle so you can actually watch the paths of the optimizer and how it's tracing, which will be pretty useful. Um, we've, been, we've spent more time looking at stuff uh, as far as output go that is more for DBAs and less for guys like us who are actually writing the code. Because the ones of us who are writing the code, we have debuggers. There's no reason to put our shit in the database. Uh, open source, uh, our open source is methodology. Uh, internal, external contributors are all treated uh, equally as well. Um, one of our strongest uh, contributors nowadays has never even worked at Sun. Um, you know, he's now, he's got a couple different job offers from other companies to go work on Drizzle. Uh, he doesn't, he's never worked at Sun. Uh, he's somebody who showed up, who happened to have uh, done a bunch of uh, graduate work in uh, optimizers and has just turned out to be wonderful. We've got a couple of other students floating around. These people never work for us. And we obviously have contributors from other companies nowadays, and they don't work for us. So, and everybody is treated equally as far as we're concerned. It doesn't matter to me where you are employed at, at all. I could care less where you're employed at. Your patches are valued based on where your patches themselves. Anybody who wants to come in and do code reviews can do code reviews. Um, in fact, one of the things is we started out using a captain system, and we've actually started pulling away from the captain system just because we wanted more people to do more reviews. So less captain systems, more reviews, and more feedback directly to the actual individuals. It's more work out of for us, but we're finding that our level of code quality went up and our communication level actually went up at the same time. Um, all project information is public on Drizzle. Um, there are no internal sun anything. It is all publicly available um, and all available up on, um, uh, up on Launchpad. Uh, we release early release often, uh, four month milestone cycles. Uh, we have hit we have hit the deadline on these for the last three. We release every two weeks on a clock. Every two weeks on Monday we release. No problems. We have not missed this in. I think since we began it, we never miss it at all. We do this by keeping our tree entirely buildable at all points in time. There's at no point where we allow any code that goes in that allows any single line of regression. Therefore, any line or any point in any day, we can create uh, a version of the tree. So we reliably drop code every two weeks. Um, things to know, we use Launchpad, we use the bug system, we use VZR, we use blueprints, we use distributed regression systems. We started early on using BuildBot, which I'm still happy in some regards because of, uh, it gives you a certain ability to work with some people as far as the machines go, uh, getting access to it. But I'll be bluntly honest, uh, and I'll even show a picture of it uh, here in a bit, Hudson is amazing. Hudson is probably the first Java application I've ever run into that actually makes me want to install Java. There's even like an Android application to control your build farm and an iPhone one to control your build farm. Uh, build farm. The, yes, it is. Hudson, Hudson is like, it's interesting when you look at, at BuildBot looks like hack and slash barely put together by developers and Hudson looks like, like, like we didn't pay for this product kind of kind of thing. It's absolutely amazing as the system goes. Um, and hopefully uh, I'll get Eric up here in a little bit. Um, other things to know, uh, we were translated we were translated into 30 plus languages within the first three months. Uh, we use Git text. Um, so we use Git text internally. Um, everything is translatable. That by the way is an old slide. We're actually in more languages than this because I know that like we got three more uh, three more uh, sub uh, some three more non-Hindi Tamil dialects recently um, out of uh, India. So we are supported in a ton of languages right now, and we are supported deeply in the database in tons of languages because every single piece of text in the database we have Git text on it nowadays. And since we use Rosetta off of Launchpad, our, our translations just continue to grow. Um, it's really, really amazing how many people show up and just keep doing translations in there. And some of them are not full translations, some of them are partial translations. Um, but our number of, uh, of full translations right now beat MySQL by, more, uh, by a good factor more than a year ago. So we are actually really well translated. Um, which has turned out handy because we have a fairly active dev uh, community in China. We have de active devs uh, right now in Malaysia. Um, we've been picking up active devs all around the planet, partially as I go give talks. Um, and uh, they also help with all of these things. Um, like I said, we went over 100 plus contributors uh, at the beginning of this year. So some of these people are people who showed up, had problems, said, hey, we were running the system, here's a bug we found, please hand, here's the bug, and we never see them again. 
Other people uh, have contributed uh, tens of thousands of lines of code at this point. Um, and so, you know, a contributor is a contributor. We don't, you know, we don't really weigh anyone in particular. The, you know, vast majority are people who come up and every so often drop a bug fix in. They're for whatever reason, they said, hey, by the way, this is a bug we found. And as they get comfortable with it, they're completely happy to keep providing bug fixes coming in. Um, it's been interesting in the last in the last half year, I don't believe Drizzle is really still production ready. Um, I think we're going to hit the point where people can start using us, testing us in production in January. Um, but last year, Christmas, we had a fairly large cluster of Drizzle databases in Britain where a guy didn't realize that when I said it really wasn't ready, and actually had a lot of Drizzle databases. And they got, hey, how do we upgrade? And we're like, we haven't solved that problem. And we had to solve that problem. And so we solved that problem. And since then, nowadays, when I actually give talks, and I go give talks in large rooms, and I say, who's using Drizzle? I actually, nowadays, get three or four hands raised. It's kind of interesting to suddenly actually see that happen. So our usage is actually growing, even though we ourselves don't consider our self-production just yet. Um, in spite of this, this is one of the things that makes me Saturn hell. We got listed as a, an open source project that actually had uh, major contributions uh, from women. Um, and I was like, really? I'm like, and like, you guys did it by what? Mailing list? Check code? Check code. And it turns out, like, yeah, we actually have had, we've had a number of women who have actually sent us patches in. I consider the fact, the fact that we were looked, at, looked upon as a, a, as a open source project that was doing well, when frankly I only know about two women contributors ever that are ongoing. That's all. So, as far as I'm concerned, we're a complete fail on this one. And this is something I really love to see. And as projects go, um, we have tried to be very, we've tried to change the behavior in order to entice women. This is something I, we talked about in Asia also, to, to entice other folks. Um, we do not allow in our mailing list. We will throw people off the mailing list for being an asshole. If people are confrontational or, 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 or you know, call people names, we will throw them off the mailing list. That is not considered acceptable behavior um, to our community. We set that out in the very initial in the very initial setup meeting at OzCon over a year and a half ago, one of the things was, if somebody calls somebody a name, they're off the mailing list. We will not accept behavior. Because that kind of behavior just continues to drive that kind of behavior. And in the end, it makes women entirely uncomfortable. Um, and frankly, it makes a lot of men uncomfortable. So in our world, we do not accept those forms of behaviors at all uh, in our mailing list. Hey, thank you. Innovation happens elsewhere. We have a bunch of folks work on other things. We continue to look at the Federated X engine. If Monty and them get it, uh, get the sucker cleaned up further than when we last looked at it, we'll probably happily take it. Uh, uh, let's see. We have transport stuff that was all done initially outside of Sun. BlitzDB. BlitzDB. Uh, it, it's kind of fun to read the blogs. On so BlitzDB is a database being done in Japan that uh, has actually some uptake. And what it is, is it's Drizzle. So when they recompile, uh, we have a configure option to rename our name. I believe Monty ever did it. Uh, or maybe the guy's just copying and pasting it. And BlitzDB is Tokyo Cabinet with a SQL interface in front of it. And so Tomosaku has BlitzDB. And what it is, is he's actually disabled all the rest of the engines. And so when you type create table, you get Tokyo Cabinet as your actual engine. And uh, if you don't mind reading through some benchmarks, uh, BlitzDB is actually really fast. Um, it turns out uh, his performance numbers beats my ISAM. He can benchmark way above my ISAM. Uh, in a lot of cases, he can benchmark above NODB, which ain't so hard. Um, the thing is, it's not, it's not fully transactional, um, so you're not dealing with a transactional engine for, for doing basic analytics. It's a pretty cool little engine that he's been doing. So this is a project that uh, we get most of the documentation in Japan, but we tend to keep an eye on it. Um, let's see here. You know, and the thing for him is, if you jump all the way back um, to the to that slide, you know, for him we're perfect. We provide all the glue points. He gets to write a database. <coughs> this is some Cirrus roadmap stuff that we worked on uh, a while ago. Cirrus was months ago, back when we removed the FRM file. Uh, the object-based plug uh, plugin loader was done back then. We did new replication events. We started doing this in SDL. Uh, There's a large refactor that went into StoreLock to get rid of most of the cases around StoreLock. Uh, I think we are almost at the point where we can get rid of store lock entirely, which would be kind of nice. Um, as soon as we can fix the uh, case with the shit, uh, as soon as we can get rid of the case of um, uh, anyway, there's a couple more things that once we get cases, we're, we're going to be able to do some more. 
We can start caching tables, so things like um, the open lock don't really interfere with us anymore. Um, Bell, um, Bell is one we've been looking at for uh, server-side scripting, um, so kind of why I'm talking to you about that. Uh, new information engine, uh, the new information engine went in, it's there. I think I may have found a bug in it, but uh, other than that, it looks pretty good. We're still accepting uh, new work as far as insert work here for uh, this particular uh, uh, period of time. Um, I was working with somebody who had a uh, concept of doing table functions. So we might actually have table functions inside of the database as well. Um, if the scripting languages go in, we'll probably have, you know, <coughs> nice cool MapReduce, uh, Greenplum type stuff inside of Drizzle, uh, which is nice. Uh, you know, these are some old benchmarks. Here's some stuff that, uh, where if you want to get involved with this later on, launchpad.net, Drizzle. So also you can just go to drizzle.org, thanks to Mike Shiel. Um, you can always branch Drizzle right here, as far as things. We have a very active mailing list. It's got six, seven hundred people on it, of people giving feedback. Who do we value on that mailing list? We really value, um, uh, basically, DBAs, people who are actually going to deploy Drizzle. We take our feedback from them about, hey, can we remove this? How is this used? How can we do make an improvement on this? Um, you know, we have recent discussions on decimal. The decimal type is kind of funky. Do we want to get rid of it? And the answer was no. But we started getting good feedback on ways to actually replace it and make it actually better and actually have it store larger result sets and even basically uh, get it to reuse other libraries. So that was kind of a fascinating discussion. We get lots of good feedback from people, um, which is what we really, really love um, out of uh, out of individuals on the mailing list. Um, you know, and our mailing list is anything from that to a simple, hey, uh, here's a change in our code style. What does everybody think about that? Um, we have lots of little, like, we have a very long code style list that we maintain and that we actually uh, keep the code to. Um, there's a number of things that I'm just going to skip, uh, I skip because these slides change over time. Um, <coughs> people will ask, like, other things about Drizzle. Um, do we have a strict mode, which is your ANSI, your SQL modes? We have no SQL modes whatsoever. If you stick in a value, if you have an enum that's A, B, C, and you stick in the a value of dog, we throw an error. If you have an insert, that has garbage data in it, we do not just stick null in and throw a warning. We throw an error. We throw errors on any of that. Um, we believe that you actually care about your data, which means that you will want us to throw an error if you shove in the wrong data. So there are no gotchas in Drizzle on that. There are no gotchas in Drizzle on it. Hey, I hit, you know, I did dash P, but I did dash P, but since I didn't say localhost, my SQL prompt dropped me to the wrong database, and then I dropped my schemas, and it sucks because I was running two databases on the same machine. But we don't do that. Um, our command line tools are a little saner when it comes to these things. They do. They actually use the dashes that all the other uh, tools do. Um, some other things like that. Um, you know, if you go down through the gotcha list, somebody took the domain MySQL gotcha list, applied it to Drizzle, um, and said, "How many of you guys have left of these?" Um, the answer is very, very, very few of these are left, and I got to go look back, and I suspect not many of them are probably even from that point. Um, just, just doing a lot of the nice fixes in the DDL. There are things to know, though. Things we do not support. If you're interested in full text, we don't support full. We don't support full text at this point. If somebody takes Sphinx, gets it back working for us, we'll have something for full text. But today, we do not support full text. We don't support GIS data at all. We don't, we don't support the operators for them. We don't support the IDs for them. We had somebody who was working on a patch to provide us functions back through the function interface. And if we had that, then we would do that. We do not support, how many I got? Five minutes, two minutes? You're 15 over, but there's two over here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> OK. OK, I, I think the big last one we, I will say, things we don't support, which I, I usually gets a grin out of people. We support a blob. We don't support a tiny blob, a medium blob, and a big blob, or a baby blob, or a mom blob, or anything like that. We support integers. We support 32-bit integers. We support 64-bit integers. We do not support 3-byte integers, who even the Intel guys looked at us and said, what the fuck? <laughs> so that is kind of the case. If you're interested in more, uh, come find me while you're eating food, and I'll, 